You're watching EVH and Gear TV, brought to you by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for EVH and Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones. An official Van Halen merchandise is provided by vanhalenstore.com. And now, here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH artist Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, it is a weekend. Happy Friday to you all and welcome to EVH and Gear TV. We are live and I've brought back a familiar face. You might recognize this dude, good friend from back in the fall, Jeff Waters from Annihilator. How you doing, Jeff? Very good. My kid says I basically look like an egg with some hair on the top. So there you go. Okay. That's the familiar part of me, the <laughs> egg with the hair on the top. I'm doing good and I keep forgetting you're not sitting in Los Angeles right beside Eddie on the hill. You're uh, an Ontario man. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Right on. We need more Canadians on the show. We're outnumbered by uh, the, the people across the border. It's nice to have some fellow Canadians on here uh, once in a while. And I was making a joke on Facebook the other day when I was saying the only thing different um, I said uh, about you having coming back on the show is your hair is shorter and mine is longer now. That's the only there thing There you different. go. Yeah. I, I could be grayer, but you wouldn't really be able to tell with this little mess. There you go. Oh, we, got, we, got a, we got a show, everybody. We got our uh, Van Halen cups on. Cheers. on. I'm on my second cup of hot coffee. What are you drinking right now? I'm just on an espresso coffee with dump some chemical vanilla creamer in there and I'm good for the there night. There you go. There you go. I always have to I have to guzzle my coffee whenever I do these shows because I'll take a couple sips and about 45 minutes goes through and then it's cold and there's nothing worse than cold coffee unless you're of course having iced coffee, you know? There's that yeah. difference you go, you cross that barrier between cold coffee and iced coffee. Yeah. There's a big difference. Yeah, it's some, but sometimes you don't care. You just drink it. You don't realize it's cold and disgusting. You just need that fix. Do you ever, do you ever find that you put a coffee down and you know you've put a coffee down somewhere in the house or the studio? It's like, okay, I know I have a coffee, and you just yeah. you determine to go find it to finish it. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's always mine's always in the laundry room. Yeah. I always put uh, go to get the laundry or or whatever and put the coffee cup down in the detergent shelf and and that's it. I find it a few days later and it's just rotten. <laughs> I'm trying to think one day. I mean, this is really funny that we're getting off on this note, but I'll I'll give you a little pro personal embarrassing story. One of the weirdest things I've ever put in the laundry room. So one day, Sandra Lee, my better half here, she's asking me, she goes, can you make me a salad or something with some salad dressing? And it was like either Caesar salad dressing or something of the nature. I'm looking all over. I'm like, I said, I can't find it. I can't find the dressing. Oh. And she says, well, it's got to be there. It's in the fridge. And I said, I've looked. And you know us guys, we, we we don't look. But I looked. I took stuff out of the fridge, couldn't find it. <laughs> it was in the laundry room. Because I, I must have been walking with it. And then had to go grab this stuff out of the dryer instead of dropping it off at the fridge, which is on the on the way. I brought it into the laundry room and I left Caesar salad dressing there for like three days. <laughs> yeah, but I hope I hope you didn't do the the really messed up guy thing and put it back in the fridge. No, I knew better than that because it would be death in the family for sure. Yeah, yeah. So crazy, crazy oh, things. Yeah. We got. I go into a family story about that. I came home from Vancouver when I lived there for a visit, and I got home and my mom had a. One of those crafts uh, salad dressings in the fridge, best before date was four years earlier. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> My mom <laughs> this was is really really rock and metal and guitar, isn't it? That's right. That's right. My mom would do the same thing. You walk into your little pantry and it's usually, oh, that's just a recommended date. It recommended four years ago. Doesn't mean it's not safe. Okay, mom. God rest her soul. We got a bunch of people jumping in the chat. Let's go over and we'll say hi real quick and we'll get into some questions here as well. Uh, we've got Salath here. Mark Taylor's here. Uh, we've got Carlos Santin. Uh, JJ Collins is here. Mississippi Treasure Hunter is here. Insomniac Matt Quinton James. Lyle Ketchum is here. Uh, Guitar News Network is here. Uh, fantastic. JD Gonzalez is here. Ricky Mees is here. Saying hello, Eric. Hello, Jeff. We, uh, we have a bit of showers here in Steedman, Missouri. Yeah, weather's cool. You're probably cool up your way right now, too, I would assume, right, Jeff? Oh, usually up I'm near Ottawa, Canada. So that's in the Triangle, New York, Montreal, Toronto. Mm -hmm. Usually it's hell, hell here for about seven months a year and, and gets super ridiculous cold but today is uh an unbelievably warm and we actually get arizona hot for about a month and a half to two months in the summer here in ottawa it's, it's pretty brutal but we also get the uh evil cold in the in the winter gotcha gotcha yeah we're, we're a little cooler today as well it's been very nice here recently but uh thomas santiago is here as well too uh jd gonzalez says the biggest venezuelan fan of jeff is here so you have fans from venezuela you've got a lot of fans overseas which we're going to talk about here shortly um, let me see here. Blimp, uh, Insomniac Matt says Eric should stay out of the kitchen. I agree on that. Blimpus, hello, Eric and Jeff and all. Jeffrey Monroe is here. Uh, Daryl McMillan saying hello, everyone. Single Coil Lover is here. And Insomniac Matt says on Wednesday we had a quarry blast that either happened at the same time or caused a 2.2 Richter earthquake. Not good. Not good at all. So we're, we're not that bad. We're just getting some, some wind. Best, 
Best name is Single Coil. Yes. That one there. What was that? Single Coil Lover? Yes. That was well, good. Her, her husband goes by the name of Humbucker Lover sometimes as well, too. So there's Single Coil <laughs> and Humbucker. So that's awesome. That's good. Yeah. So listen, you just got back. Let's start off the show by talking about the tour. Like you were overseas for quite some time and then you're going back again. Is that correct? Yeah. It's uh, actually been touring pretty heavy since 2015, more than usual since 2013. But then 2015 hit and it feels like we pretty much have been nonstop. Uh, if we weren't touring, we were, you know, getting ready for another one. So that's, I, I was going to have this whole summer off. It would have been my, pretty much my first summer off in decades. And it turned into, okay, we, uh, the agent said we could do three in a row. It's Czech Republic, Germany, and uh, Holland mm -hmm. festivals in, in July. And I'm like, ah, and then you know, like, I really love this, but, you know, I was looking forward to my one summer where it was done, you know, finished, no music. Well, yeah, that's a lie. I, I can't, can't get away from it. But, um, you know, enjoying my hometown's nice summers and the city and friends and things like that, it, just the idea of it's amazing. And then the agent goes, well, three shows in a row and three nights, three different countries. We can fly, we can fly you into all three or we can tour bus it or whatever, but we can make it work. And I'm like, hey, that's, it's a, pain in the butt for for someone who's looking forward to the summer and then he sent me how much money we would get for the three shows and i said i'm in yeah and i called the guy i called the guys said uh you know that vacation time we had how about three in a row in rehearsals in canada and then it turned into okay barcelona rock fest a week earlier asked us to go in and then we thought in between that festival which is a massive one ozzy priest uh, yeah. and all these great ones um you can't say no to those kind of things and so it, in the week between the three and the barcelona one okay let's do a fan sort of almost free fan show in munich like we've been doing lately and then 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 the offers start pouring in and everybody goes oh and i later are available for touring this summer so it's a uh, we're not going to do a lot but there's some stuff definitely in there and uh, it's not going to be a summer off <laughs> yeah true you know, sometimes you just be careful what you wish for. You want to be off, and then you'd rather be out there touring, or you know, it's, it's nice sometimes to be busy. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, reality check is fifty-two-year-old Canadian playing thrash and heavy metal, mm -hmm. uh, working on the seventeenth record, uh, talking to people, seeing people from around the world touring, um, playing to, you know, from four hundred people to one hundred twenty thousand. I mean, it's, you know, you cannot. If you ever start complaining, you can get a real reality check and, and, and wake up and go, dude, you're really lucky. You're not uh, the level of a Pantera or a Slayer here. Mm -hmm. You're really lucky you've got things going the way you do. And, uh, you know, my life's pretty freaking good. It's, it's, it's awesome. So, yeah, it's easy to get a little diva-ish once in a while. But, uh, you know, you, you, there's enough reality checks going on that you know where you are in the business and how lucky you are. That's right. Yeah, there's a lot of people that would be love to that would love to do what you're doing. So yeah, you just have to sit back and think about it. You know what? Yep, it's it's a blessing, and let's uh, let's continue with it while it's here. For sure. Yeah, that's right. Main thing, main main thing is I get really cool guitars sent to me, mm -hmm. and I get to get to go to concerts free and hang out backstage and inside of the stage and watch my favorite bands. That's what I've been realizing. One of the best benefits to all the hard work I've done with my band to keep it going and mm -hmm. to do hopefully as good as I can at that. You know album cycle as I can, um, and all the struggles and all this stuff you go through to keep it going. Uh, I, I realized the other day, one of the top things is you get to meet all these great musicians that you and bands that you love when you were younger and tour with them, a lot of them, but even just to, to have some of the summer off and, and look up concerts that are happening somewhere around where I live and going, Hey, I know this guy and, and knowing that you can get in free. <laughs> exactly. Like yeah. Little things like that. Those things you should really not take for granted and uh, enjoy the fact that you can do a lot of these little things. And like you're saying too, like talking about guitars, sometimes, I mean, with your schedule, you don't get a chance to just go stop into the local music store as much as you'd like to. And a lot of times you have guitars show up on your doorstep and some things that you may or may not ever check out. All of a sudden, wow, this is cool. I, I've always said this, the best guitars will find you when you're not looking for them. That's what I find. When you go out searching for a guitar, you've got your, your eye on a Strat, you want to get a Strat, and, you know, you don't find the right one until it's an accidental. So when something shows up at your doorstep, sometimes you're like, wow, this is cool. Like some of the ones you were showing on Facebook, you had the, uh, the Epiphone, Tommy Thayer and the, uh, the uh, uh, Faulkner one as well. Those literally showed up on the doorstep. Yeah. And um, I, I just want to dive into guitars because I'm, I know you. And mm -hmm. uh, even if we weren't on camera, you know what we'd be doing, showing each other guitars and <laughs> yeah, things like would. that. New, 
new things that were sent to us by line six or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Gibson Epiphone or Van Halen stuff. But I got yep. this really cool one that showed up on my doorstep. That's kind of a lie. Um, I bought this one uh, from the company Mean Street uh, guy who does some, uh, Mitch, who does some amazing, amazing Van Halen-esque type of guitars. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got one of the ones off his site months ago. And uh, oh, it was just, I'm looking at it now. It's my lead guitar. Uh, my What is it? Oh, yeah, it's one of my lead guitars in the studio for the next record I'm doing. I've got two for rhythm and lead, which is uh, Wolfgang Stealth uh, USA model. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at it now. Yeah. Um, and one of my uh, my second signature Vs. So I've got pick my three and I'm working on new sounds, even though I'm supposed to have the summer off. And of course, I know I'm jumping right in, but and right there. There you go. The, uh, he like, looks- you know, from my last appearance with you, uh, I guess last year That's was right. um, I've been a Helix fan right from the beginning. So uh, and now apparently you've taken over that role and I'm laid back and you know everything about the Helix <laughs> and I'm just a beginner. And I get to no. get to ask you for questions on how I can figure out input, homage, impedance stuff. <laughs> sure. I'm far from an expert, man, but I I, I got to give credit where credit is due. And we're going to talk a lot about Helix as well tonight, too, because a lot of people don't realize, uh, especially the Van Halen fans are starting to realize this now with the shows here that you can really get some cool Van Halen tones. Uh, but I'm far from an expert, but I'd be more than happy to help you with some, you know, some guidance, getting some signals in and some signals out and stuff like that. But yeah, when you come on, I didn't know anything about it other than the name. And I knew obviously about line six, um, but I didn't really have a full understanding of the product. And you were saying, how are you use that? You know, like pretty much as the main thing for the record, you're using it live. I was like, holy cow, I got to take a look at this. And to fast forward a little further, you know, I started getting into it. I was sending you some patches. You were digging those. And uh, I got to give a thanks to one of the fellows, too. He's a friend of mine, too. He goes by Coffee Drinker online. He'll yeah. probably be in the chat. But Brian Cazell, he wrote that one patch that I sent you, the 5150, the Van Hagar one, yeah. which was quite cool. Yeah. But yeah, I, that's the stereo one. That was fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And even surprisingly, even in a mono rig, it still sounds good. So it's not dependent fully on stereo. Obviously, that's when you get your best, you know, kind of your, you know, uh, that pitch detune effect that Eddie's known for. Um, but that's, uh, it can still be mono. But if you, are yeah. you able to grab that one 5150 guitar? Are you able to grab it and still have your phone there? Because I, I would love people to see that one. Yeah. Let's see Let if you can. see if I can. Even uh, if you have to swing around a little bit. Little. I'll just go by uh, the light here because I'm sitting kind of in the dark over there. But yep. uh, no problem. Yeah, but tell me if you can even see this. Got all these fluorescent lights going off. Now, yeah, oh yeah we, got a, that... we got a good shot of that for sure. Yeah, this is, you can see the, the shiny stripe part on it and the flat, dull black uh, body. It's mm-hmm. a totally, yeah, it is dull black. Uh, forget the word for it, matte black. Yeah, like a matte. Black. Mm-hmm. And it's got, uh, well, Mean Street logo. It's kind of hard to see that, but it's got this incredible sort of charcoal-y coal, <laughs> I don't know what it is, neck on it. Mm-hmm. Maybe hard to see from this, but, but it does uh, accent the flat black. Yeah, this thing is is sick. Like I host this jam session on a metal world's biggest metal cruise called Seventy Thousand Tons of Metal, and I brought that down to play uh, on the cruise. And I, I bring a lot of guitars. I'm I'm really lucky that Epiphone and the boss Jim Rosenberg are very uh, very open. You know, like when you're endorsed by a company and when you have some signature models. You know, there's contracts, of course, that say you can't use other models, mm-hmm. especially in social media and all this stuff. And uh, they're really good about that, partly because some of the guitars I have, like, for example, the one I just showed you is a Kramer. Mm-hmm. So we know Gibson owns Kramer and yep. Gibson are basically partners, uh, separate but together companies with Gibson Epiphone. Mm-hmm. So there is a tie there that I'm allowed. But I mean, to be on your show and stuff, I'm sure there's some there will be some companies depending on the artist's deal that would have an issue with that. Yep. Right. Um, yep. But they're fantastic. They know that, you know, I have, I'm not showing off here, but I've got a, this mm-hmm. is my studio collection of guitars nice here. Arsenal. And, and it's, it's like, you know, he's really cool. He knows guitar players. If they are able to have different guitars, you, you don't always stick to the same brand. Um, but he knows I use these things live, the Epiphones that I, I do. And he knows I stand behind them and love them and sell them and promote them and all that. Mm-hmm. But he also knows I'm a Van Halen freak. He also knows uh, I like Angus Young. So I like the the Gibson SGs and the Angus versions and Diablos and things and and other kinds of guitars. That's why they, they actually, I think they probably, because I love Epiphone so much and work hard for them and, and Gibson, mm-hmm. that they're pretty open to me just, in other words, people that actually know me, usually most of them are in Europe, they know I have a bunch of guitars. They know I play different guitars, but they also know that the Epiphone and Gibsons are my favorite things in the world. So I think uh, they don't have a problem with me 
promoting other stuff in a way, you know? That's right. Well, I think a lot of it has to do with, too, like everyone I've talked to, and this is something we'll get into as well, talking about your guitar playing talent, that I hear feedback from people. But the another thing I hear uh, uh, from most people that in the industry is how easy you are to work with. You're an easygoing dude. And that has a lot to do with it, too. If you're this jerk going in there with this list of demands, okay, my guitars have to be this, they have to be this, blah, 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 and have like basically a rider walking into some of these A&R guys, I could see some people saying, well, if you're not going to play our guitars only uh, as an exclusive, we don't want to work with you. So there's a big difference between going in there, you know, catching more flies with honey as opposed to, uh, you know, the the old cliche, right? Yeah, I, I think there's lots of things. I mean, I'm no saint, but mm-hmm. I, I did learn over the years some things that helped me survive in this, in quote, business, because it is a business, and mm-hmm. obviously, and you got to take care of the business in order to be an artist, you That's know, right. to be a musician, right? So mm-hmm. in most cases, um, so I quit drinking almost 20 years ago, and, and I wasn't a jerk when I was drinking. It was more of a, I just wasn't taking care of business. Right. Um, and it was affecting, starting to affect things. If I'd kept going, it would have been, it might have killed me. But mm. that really helped me over the last 19, 20 years to focus on myself and things. And, you know, tr- you know, I also tried as hard as I could to not piss people off. Mm-hmm. I, I did see, I have seen for decades that thing about where you see a, a band, whether the younger or middle age or whatever, uh, sort of take off with their career all of a sudden and turn into real jerks. Mm-hmm. Most of the time they end up crashing and people just don't, it is true. People just don't want to help you out when you've had that wild ride up and you've shit on everybody. And then you're, yeah. you're, so I, you know, I've kind of learned that. So sometimes when I feel like saying something that I am angry at or opinionated about, like that I don't like or whatever, or a person I don't or a band or something's going on, I usually just bite my tongue because I know that it's going to come back to haunt me. And I've had a couple of good examples of that. I won't get into them, but yeah, of course. One with KK Downing with Judas Priest. I'll tell you this one. It's it's a long story, but I'll try to make it short. Him and I were quote buddies on the 1991 tour we did with them in uh, for their Painkiller album in Europe, and we were good friends. We went out partying, drinking, having fun. It was just a wild time. You know, imagine a kid of twenty something years old. Yeah, touring stadiums and arenas with priests on that and the opening act that was unknown was called pantera oh my god so yeah you can imagine and our album was our biggest album called never never land theirs was called painkiller so that was just one hell of a tour and so i was buddies with him for a long time and then got very comfortable and sat around i think at a ski hill lodge while everybody else is skiing we're having some booze a restaurant watching people ski and i said hey so ken it was his name. It's his name, Ken. Uh, what, what's your favorite, uh, what's your least favorite Priest album? Or I, I can't remember the, this might even not even be the exact words of the album, sure. but the gist of it was something like, I kept pushing him to pick an album that he thought sucked. And oh. I'm thinking, that's how, that's how you get kind of like too comfortable sometimes. And, you know, I started suggesting one. Oh. And it turns out, I think the one that I suggested out of all their, at that time, 14 records, mm-hmm. The one I suggested, I think, was the one that he was given full charge of for writing and, and doing. Oh, no. <laughs> so I picked out, I think I picked out the one out of 14 I shouldn't have picked. Yep. And it was just a, it was just a fun between two guitar players. Forget the age and the fame and the, you know, the bank accounts and the status and all the bullshit. Mm-hmm. This is just two guys who had a lot of things in common, were on tour, became buddies. And after that, it was pretty tough to keep that relationship going. Yeah. So, I learned I learned a big one, and same with on the same tour, we learned that Pantera, the drummer, this Vinny guy was cool. He had this Van Halen shuffle, mm-hmm. and but it was metal. It was like Lars Ulrich with some Van Halen shuffle. The guitar player was Randy Rhodes, James Hetfield, Tony Iommi, Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, right? And solos and rhythm, and the band was like cool. The singer had it was different. He had shorts on. He had shaven, partially shaven head with tattoos. Look like a Henry Rollins or a punk guy. Yeah. And that was that was not that was not seen in the metal world at that point in 1991. Nobody had ever seen that. Now it's common. Yeah. But he was Phil, for example, a singer of Pantera, was on stage giving the middle finger to crowds that weren't reacting. And these are the traditional German or Dutch or whatever, traditional heavy metal 80s crowd, and you're insulting them. This this is normal now, but yeah. you never did that back then. So I and my band made this judgment privately that these guys are so talented, but they're never going to get anywhere with that kind of attitude. 
of course, what happens. Yeah. Right. So Boom. I learned from those, those two incidents were all on the same tour. And those were two big incidents that, that taught me to shut the F up and, and just uh, be polite and nice to as many people as you can. It's not fake. It's nope. more of a just being courteous and, and polite because you may need their help later on. Yeah. Or you just actually feel better because you're being nice about things. It, right? com- it I mean, comes around. It sounds cheesy, no, good. Yeah. It's good juju, good karma. It'll come back to you. And this uh, today with uh, social media, the way it is and gossip magazines and all these online rag magazines. So things can get taken out of context, even with, not even saying what you said. And they put two sentences together and all of a sudden uh, you're the jerk. And you never even yeah. said it. I know Mike Portnoy from Sons of Apollo. He's been getting it a lot. He always makes jokes about it. Um, you know, he'll he'll do some interviews and he'll say something about Metallica, and and he loves Metallica. He loves Lars. They're good friends. And all of a sudden, this gets put together and makes him sound like a jerk. And he's like, you know, I'm damned if I do, damned if I don't. I open my mouth. I, and he's not saying uh, spiteful things, but it's just people. The media is out to get you sometimes. Yeah, I know. And also, I know a lot of people too that that will say things. And when you're, oops. Hang on. Yep. We're good. We? There we are. Yep. Back on. Yep. We're good. Uh, I know some people too that will say things personally or backstage or just just even so, to some journalists where you sit down and talk to them. And sometimes I'm like, oh no, because you know what you're saying to them and they know, but mm-hmm. they're going to run with those lines. Yeah. The way the way you said it can be taken another way, but and you know, especially like you said, social media. Anybody people have cameras. Yeah. I mean, in the old days. Like this is not, um, ah, I get too far off topic, but you know, with, with social media, especially with video cameras and stuff, I mean, it's, uh, you gotta be careful with a lot of things you say and a lot of things you do. That's right. Just, you could be coming off the tour bus. You might be sick with the flu and there's someone right there with the camera and you're like, you know, you know, you, you don't want to see that person with the camera. You're just a human being. And you know, like, you know what the F is going on, you know, all of a sudden, okay, all oh, great. There's TMZ, right. You know, and yeah, you're right there. And it's, it's, you can never be too careful. Yeah, I've been, I've been lucky because uh, something you, you were about to touch on or just touched on was uh, Annihilator has a lot of fans outside of the country or yeah. outside of North America. And essentially, for people that don't know, we, we've uh, put 16 records out, studio records out, done a lot of touring and sort of never stopped since 89, for, since our first album came out. But our first three albums did well in North America and worldwide, but then North America died for us in 93, Mm -hmm. but everything else just kept going or going up overseas. So it's kind of like weird because we're an unknown band, mostly in North America, no press, people don't know us much. uh, And, uh, and that's awesome because I actually get to come back to Canada and just, you know, live a normal life. Mm -hmm. Whereas I know this sounds kind of silly, but when I go to Germany, if I go to a shopping mall, or a movie theater, or, or some Starbucks, or something, or a real German coffee shop. Yeah, real one. Uh, you just get, you do get noticed, and it is really cool for your ego, and it makes you feel good short term, real quick. Uh, but then it can also get ridiculous. Like I can't go to concerts. I can't actually go out in the crowd because everybody's like, "Holy shit!" Blah blah blah. And then the band will get angry that something's happening over there, and it's not a big problem. It's just my point is, it's cool for me because it's like a part time want to be rock star gig yeah. where I go over and to these certain places in the world and we do very well. And then I can come back here, not tour in North America, which sucks, but anyway, uh, but not tour, not really be known here and just have a sort of normal life and keep my head together for the next time we go overseas. That's, so, that's good because look at some of these guys out there, like, you know, the slashes, Yeti Van Halen's were uh, the kisses where they're known, you know, in every country of the world, they can't, they can't do anything without being mobbed. You know, as cool as that is, like you say, it's a nice ego stroke, but at the same time, day-to-day life is not the norm for those guys. And that's why sometimes we look at some people, and I'm not using those people in question, but just your typical rock stars out there, sometimes, you know, they, you read some bad press on them out there. It's like, well, do you blame them? I mean, for the, they can't go get a, to the variety store and grab something. They can't go to the beer store or to pick up a pack of smokes or whatever the case may be without being mobbed. So they're, you know, it comes with the territory. But that's I'm sure cool, they though. didn't. I'm sure a lot of them didn't think of that part of it when they were starting out, or as as they got more famous, they just enjoyed the attention and the money, and and that their music was being appreciated. But then it it becomes ridiculous on the bigger levels. Also, Annihilator was uh, kind of our, my band is really well. It's not at the level, and uh, you know, I think we're a good band for what we're doing, but we're not like you know. I'm I'll be the first to admit it. We're nowhere near like a lot of the bands you mentioned, ACDC, Van Halen, mm-hmm. Slayer, you know, all these bands, I consider them at this level here 
not just sales and popularity, but how good they are. Um, I never sort of got there. I wanted to, but that wasn't my whole driving force. Survival and just making music was the number one. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, it, it hasn't been much of a problem because I'm just at this level where it's perfect. It, it's not too crazy on the tours. We can we can tour very well, eat well, travel really well. Um, you don't if you don't want to eat crappy food or you want to, uh, you can, if you want to do drugs and drink and smoke, you can, or yeah. you can not do it. You can be vegan or vegetarian. We got that on guys on the rider that are vegan, which is kind of tough to deal with on these tours, but I can imagine. Yeah. And I have a nut allergies, peanut allergies, and, and there's all these different things. Uh, but we're at a good level where if it just keeps going like this, I'm the happiest guy in the world. That's good. You can't complain with that. And I'm seeing all these writers from different bands as well, too. You're seeing the, uh, all these vegetarian and, and, and special requirements. That's the thing. Oh, we lost it. <laughs> we got gotcha. you. That's, that's part of, that's part of the, uh, this part of the world today. You know, it's kind of cool. Let's yeah, jump, let, sure. let's jump over the chat. And as I come back, I'll let you think about this for a second. Something I read on your website, which I thought was very, very cool. I've been on the website a, a dozen different times. Um, but I'd never read this quote before, and it's a uh, it's kind of a testimony from uh, from Dave Elfson from from Megadeth, and he had said something along the lines of uh, how he thinks your band Annihilator is kind of like an extension to the Big Four, and how important your first record was to them when they were writing. So I so think about it for a second when we come back after saying hi to a few more people. Think I just like to ask you how it made you feel, and and where does Megadeth fit in your list of uh, you know influences going up uh, you know over the years as well. So over in the chat, uh, Mississippi Treasure Hunter says, coffee is like EVH TV. You want it every day, but sometimes you don't get it. Best show around. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Single Coil Lover says she feels famous. Thomas Santiago says, hey, Single Coil Lover. Um, and there is a, uh, a uh, super chat donation from Guitar News Network. Thank you so much, guys. That was very, very, uh, very nice and appreciated. Um, uh, Hussam El Anori is, says hello there. Mark Taylor is here saying, hey. Um, Okay, this is a good one. This uh, uh, this is like asking which is your favorite child, and I'm sure you know which question is going to come. Uh, but, uh, Mississippi Treasure Hunter is asking which is your favorite guitar. Probably your signature one. I'm going to go with. Nope. <laughs> which one? Sorry, you phone. It's okay. I think. Well, you pick one of the Van Halen guitars, mm -hmm. definitely. But I'm going to have to go with this. Um, let me see if you guys can see this one. I've seen you play that one a lot. It, I don't, I'll just let it sit here. I don't really play it that much. It's, uh, I've seen pictures of it. 50 of the made. It's a uh, golden red, uh, Gibson Diablo. It was called. It was one of the Gibson's guitars of the month, mm -hmm. uh, back in 2008, 9, 10, or something like that. So, I mean, it's not the world's most expensive guitar. It's not the best playing guitar whatsoever. But being an Angus fan and seeing a red guitar like that and seeing a special edition kind of thing called the Diablos, uh, just for some reason, I love it. I, I don't even need to play the thing. I just put it up there. For playing, though, my new uh, favorites are actually the ones I'm using on my new record, okay. which is right right beside me. For favorites for actual real-world use, mm -hmm. uh, it's the Charcoal Wolfgang again. I've used that for a few records. Uh, that's mainly a rhythm guitar for me. Okay. Uh, part rhythm, some of the, when I need more aggressive sort of rhythm sound, I don't know if you can see this, yes, but this is a... Uh, where is it? Hello. There it is. Yep. Um, it's a Annihilation 2, the second model that I had by Epiphone. Mm -hmm. And this newly acquired one I talk, talked to you about already, the Mean Street thing. Nice. And that's a lead guitar only. So, yeah, it's it, it's it's fun. It's, you know, with all these guitars, I could, and I have a Rickenbacker bass that I've been using in the last few records. So if you, if you take the three that I just showed you, the Rickenbacker, Maybe throw in an Epiphone acoustic and a Yamaha classical. Uh, I don't need any of the stuff you're looking at or any of the stuff I have in storage. It's not even, it's, it's just like a, either free guitars or a guitar I had to get and and, and pay for like a normal person. And, <laughs> or, you know, uh, they're just, or cool Van Halen guitars. But so I really only need five. I figured that one out um, a few years back going like I can do records with five of them right oh, and I'm the bass player and the guitar player on the record so I love it but yeah I'm sure there's times you pick up guitars that you haven't even touched in maybe a couple of years all of a sudden oh man I missed you right <sighs> no you don't have that I'm not I'm not that much of a technical guy I don't really know a lot about like for example this helix that I've been 
you know, promoting is, is the, the weakest word for that. I've been just telling everybody, you've got to check this out. Yep. Uh, but I technically don't know a lot about, like, I, what I do know is, for example, okay, this is just my, my board and some of my gear and some other gear over there. Mm -hmm. But I know how to do the specific jobs that I need to know for my band in the studio, which is engineering, producing, mixing, mm -hmm. mastering. Um, but I, I basically have to hire some friends of mine techs to come over because I don't know how to wire pickups. I don't really know stuff about impedance and pots and the sure. guitars. I don't know even how to put a jack in or solder stuff, you know? So it's more like, uh, and with guitars, I tend to, to sort of be drawn towards the cheaper, the cheaper guitars. And the reason is, and, and I go back to Van Halen, ironically, mm -hmm. uh, of course he's got the most famous, Famous, most amazing things have came out of the the world's cheapest guitar that he put together himself for what three hundred bucks U.S. I don't know what yeah, it was, but at best, yeah. So, so there's something about Angus Young and Eddie Van Halen's okay playing, but also the necks and, and on some of these guitars. I know Angus uses some of the cheaper models, mm -hmm. the, the kind of store bought ones, uh, on some old beaten up ones occasionally. He doesn't use a lot of guitars, that guy. Um, these cheaper ones have a more lively, imperfect, sloppy, messy kind of tone to them. And I'd always, you know, I'd had friends with Paul Reed Smith and all these super expensive $5,000 guitars and, and, and this, and I get it for recording now. Now I figured it out after decades, like this, uh, USA Wolfgang, mm -hmm. for example, I'd always had these problems where I was using over there, I was using for years, a Dave Mustaine ESP from 2001 era and it was the perfect sound and it had that lively neck but I would always have a problem tracking a bass to it because the neck was not perfect it was a quote a cheapy guitar okay it sounded amazing but when you needed that perfect intonation and that perfect bass meets guitar tuning in the studio I literally had to punch in the bass and retune the bass for certain notes to match the imperfection of the the neck on that ESP. Mm -hmm. That's why you know I learned my lesson of of spending an extra week, full week of recording, punching in notes. Yeah. Um, I decided to try a real guitar out, like a higher end. So, so I got the, some EVHs and some other Gibsons and uh, different things, and uh, I settle on this EVH because the neck is just perfect. You don't have to worry about anything being out with a bass guitar, for example. But it's it's amazing how you, you do so many records and you're supposed to be known as a good player and good in the studio at your jobs. And, and yet you're using a guitar that you have to really punch in the bass just to stay in tune with it. Uh, so that one's for sure. But with the, uh, the Van Halen mean street guitar and the, the, the waters annihilation guitars, the cheaper ones, mean streets, not cheap, but mm -hmm. the cheaper guitars just have that lively, squealy, bouncy, sloppy, messy tone to it that only Eddie and Angus get. That's right. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of drawn towards the cheaper stuff and my collection of guitars is that's my studio stuff. I got some other fair amount stored. There's some nice ones in there, but I haven't even touched them. Like there's a one over there you can't see, but it's a beautiful Les Paul. Okay. Expensive. It's it's supposed to be amazing because it's so expensive and blah, 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 blah. Well, <laughs> I, I tried it and I'm like, how do people play that thing? You know, and then I go grab my, my, uh, $600, 500 us dollar signature one to go yeah that's better yeah. <laughs> do you know what i mean well especially too it's, when all, you're, it's when, all personal taste when you're live too that's the thing i've always said before back in the day this is like long before eddie was bringing out his own guitars under his own umbrella uh through the evh gear but kramer's back in the day you know and i showed you a really cool kramer actually you can see it on the on the camera actually on the couch back there but um, yep. um some of those strikers for like three or four hundred bucks canadian back in the day now some of them had the floyd some of them had the, the floyd twos and things like that but I always found I had no stigma, no no uh, worry about playing those. If I bumped the headstock and chipped it, I didn't care, you know. And of course, at the time, that's all I could afford back then too. But there was no, I wasn't worried about it. I just played, and it was a cheap guitar. Whereas you have like a, you know, if I, my parents would have bought me a Les Paul back in the day as a kid, or you know, um, you know, Paul Reed Smith wasn't even really around, um, you know, for me as a kid. But, you know, I'd be so scared I'd want to sit down in a bubble somewhere and I'd be so focused on not smashing my guitar or scratching my guitar, yeah. I wouldn't be playing yeah. guitar. Yeah, that's true. And and another thing that that uh, you made me think about was if you're a, a guitar player in a band and you're the only guitar player, say mm -hmm. a Van Halen, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, we're old school, but yep. Van Halen, 
where there's no second guitar on, on some of his records there weren't really any second guitars that you had you know two rhythm guitars that you had to deal with maybe you'd overdub a solo and have a rhythm going on the other side or something but mm -hmm. uh in the earlier days but if you're just playing by yourself and you've got a bass player and a drummer you don't really have to be as in tune and you don't have to have that perfect intonation no. and you can you got you got a lot of room to mess around i mean if, if you hear the solo van halen tracks you listen to those and you go wow that's not exactly how i heard it on the record that's right but that's the actual track and then you hear with the band and everything just completely fits that's right and but if you want to get picky and solo it you go wow he's out of tune he's stretching the note the timing's a little off a little slop here and there but then you put the song you put it back in the song and you're like this is the most genius guitar thing ever written and played Agreed. with so much feel. If you have two guitar players, left and right channels oh playing boy. rhythm, you got to have that expensive, perfect neck guitar. Mm -hmm. You've got to have that. So I'm so amazed when I hear even there's a band from Canada called Billy Talent. Oh yeah, of course. I know them. Um, they are an ACDC, of course, uh, not on the let there be rock album or power age, but on, on a lot of their later albums. Um, the tuning on Billy Talent, for example, the stuff he's doing, the, the intonation and tuning on the guitars are just beyond sick. You, you, if you have that really zoomed in pitch and hearing in the studio like I do, it's degrading over time, but mm -hmm. I've got it. Um, I hear that Billy Talent stuff and go, how does the engineer, producer, and guitar player pull this off? It's just the most perfect notes you've ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, yeah, you got to, I think when you're a two guitar band, you, you don't have the, the option to have a fret or a part of your neck that's not perfect. Oh, that's right. Therefore, you really do need to get yourself a high end thing for the studio. That's what I think. Unless you're a, a, a one guitar band, then you can kind of get away with a few things. That's right. Well, like you, like you and, and I together, we probably, I'm sure you have a good collection of Van Halen bootlegs over the years. And I've, I've got a lot of audio, tons, like sometimes four or five different versions from the same concert. And yeah. you listen to, especially the old days, even even modern, Eddie has always been out of tune, and that's no disrespect to Eddie. I mean, the guy is a magician on the guitar, and he's, you know, kind of a, 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 I don't know, like a race car driver on the guitar. You know, he's racing that thing to, to the point of no return, and he's out of tune a lot. But like you say, it's a one-guitar player band, and who doesn't matter if it's Wolfgang playing bass or if it's Michael Anthony, uh, just that that whole feel, thing. Feel. You know, feel. Yeah. And look it's at... Feel. It's feel. It's... Yeah. That's right. Look at Dave's think, vocals too. Like Dave's vocals, not he's not the best singer, but you can you can put put that in there and everything just works. Yeah, I you know what I I always argue this with people. I I think he is one of the best singers because mm -hmm. I know what you're saying. Though. I'm not, I know you're not detracting from him. Mm -hmm. I always say though he is one of the best singers, and people look at me and go, "What?" You know, it's like defending Gene Simmons, <laughs> the guy spinning spinning blood with his tongue and yeah. trying to explain to people. If you listen to those early and mid-career Kiss records and listen to those bass lines, mm -hmm. nobody was using that kind of bass guitar playing at the time. It came from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It came from a, some 60s stuff that other people that came into rock, bass players, never listened to and never used. Gene Simmons was actually one of the most original and kick-ass bass players. Yeah. And he, of course, because of the makeup, the tongue, the the womanizing, the, 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 you know, all this stuff, he didn't get that, you know, Cream Magazine, Hip Parade, or the, all the magazines we saw in North America would always cut him down and there'd be this, who's a better player and this and that. And then Angus got the same thing. He wore a school knapsack and then he ditched it. He was wearing the school outfit, mm -hmm. running around on his back, going crazy on stage. Therefore, that means the guy must have been sloppy and not really been good, where yeah. he is, to me, is one of the best players in history on lead guitar and blues-influenced rock guitar. Mm -hmm. And, of course, energy. Nobody had the oh, energy yeah. he did mixed with the feel. And it was just, he basically took B.B. King and Chuck, Chuck uh, not Chuck Billy from Testament, Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry. Um, and uh, just took this stuff to another level and then put in this... Uh, guy that looked like he was on cocaine and speed overdosing on it nonstop for a two hour set. Mm -hmm. And yet him and Gene Simmons and David Lee Roth, because he's a showman and he wore some funny tights and clothes in the day. And he was like a ringleader circus ringleader. People didn't get that Ross freaking vocals. I don't care what anyone says. His multi toned timbered vocal notes coming from those screams that he controlled. Mm -hmm. That wasn't, Lukey, he controlled those, his blues stuff and the stuff that he got, he was almost doing 
rap kind of stuff yeah. back in the 70s, 80s. He was doing blues like had never been done in rock like that. He mm -hmm. was pulling from a lot of a lot of uh, 60s, 50s stuff, even 40s, I think, probably. And adding the showman and the circus stuff, all of a sudden, the guy must not be good. He must not of have course. a good voice. And people, especially with the internet, people carry this on now with the internet, whereas somebody says, Ross, not good vocalist. He's all a showman. Mm -hmm. People say, yeah. They just go, yeah. And I'm like, you have no clue. You just don't have a clue. Yeah, you, know? you got to be careful what you wish for, because there's other bands out there. There's some of these, and I won't mention names, but technical bands who are just freaking amazing musicians, like all of them. Every single one is a virtuoso, and each one of the members can play everyone else's instrument. And yet you watch them, and they stand there. They might as well be sitting on a stool the entire concert. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. No, do, what do you want? Do you want that? Or do you want someone that is human, has some flaws, but it's gonna you're going to remember every single moment of that concert? Yeah, you, you've got it. It's And the difference to add to that is, when Roth was doing a showmanship in the first half, up until, of course, right up until, I mean, I saw something in Montreal. I don't know what, the, when, when 1984 came out or mm -hmm. it was the one before mm -hmm. Diver Down. I, I don't remember which tour, but in Montreal, um, I mean, they'd been, they'd been quite a few albums into their career and he was doing the showmanship thing, but he was singing. He was kicking butt. Yep. It was only later that he started to, Say, well, you know, and he had that trademark thing where I forgot the words. Yeah. How, how's everybody doing tonight? And he had all these lines every time. Scripted. But he knew what the word he knew what the words were. He knew. Of course. He knew he was for, forgetting him on. It was just his like line with his possibly fake booze in his bottle. I don't know. If, Never know. Who cares. That was his stick for sure. Who cares. But the thing about him is uh he was both. He was the showman, but he was also uh Jesus, he was like, and then then later years you find out the guy was playing the acoustic guitars on that Women and Children First yeah, well, song we're all on there. He was to sail away with someone's daughter. He was playing all these guitar parts, and mm -hmm. he probably wrote some of the guitar stuff in that band. Yeah. So he's just a phenomenon, and it, I just get so I can talk to you about it, but I, because of the, what you do in the name of your show, but it's just you're beating your head against the wall if you're trying to tell anybody that's under my age. Yeah. About this band yeah it's a never win it's a it's a losing battle for you if you do i start let's start the conversation and, with anyone else and i know there's a good reason for it yeah. but van halen obviously have not done very much in the last 20 years mm -hmm. to teach teach these youngsters how good their old music was and that they still do have it i mean they they still could go into the studio tomorrow or in two years and probably pull something off unbelievable that's right and i mean eddie can school anyone now oh, yeah. and, and probably he's 100 years old with one finger, he could probably totally school everybody right now. That's right. And he's hey, I'm pretty, healthy as heck. Passionate about that. that that part I will speak out about because it uh, pisses me off when I hear uh, people not getting that at all. Just because the guy is older, mm -hmm. he's in what? Is he sixty yet? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, and you know, he had some issues 10, 15 years ago. Booze, whatever. Mm -hmm. He Roth is, you know, different voice now. You know, like all these. Hey, man, I mean. Rob Halford is 60 something and he just put out one of the best vocal performances on a record ever on this, this firepower record. They yeah, put out. Phenomenal. He sounds, he, sound, he, he, he knew where his range was right now to be able to sing some of that live. Mm -hmm. He didn't overdo it on the record. Andy Sneap got him the best vocal sound he's ever gotten in his life. And he's in his sixties. So these guys are the best and they still are at their age. It's just mind blowing. Um, and we need, we need showman back like Roth. I think and so. We need uh, we need one or two more eddies, but the problem with that is you're never going to get one ever again. <laughs> I know that's a thing. We've we've got this uh, small, very small handful of guitar heroes, you know, and who knows? Like, there's there's so much to being a guitar hero than just being a master of the guitar as well, too. You know, the legacy of what you bring along with you, a changing in, innovation uh, on the technology, um, whether it be, you know, amplifiers, effects, pedals, uh, maybe making something new on guitar that's never been done before. I don't think we're going to see too much. Like, innovation is, you know, not really there anymore. Well, I mean, it, maybe it's being older, but at the same time, it's not because how many bands have came in and did what Metallica did? Yeah. Since Metallica started in the 80s and they hit with the uh, K okay, Ride the Lightning second album, but you know, when they hit with Master Puppets and then Justice for All and then the Blackout, how many bands in any heavier kind of rock or heavy metal or thrash metal or anything have ever, 
ever come even slightly close. You put the big four guys all together without Metallica in there and Mm -hmm. add their sales up, forget it. It's just not, so it's not just, will someone come back like Eddie or like Van Halen or ACDC or whatever? I mean, Hey man, you can't, we can't even get a, a hard edged band here to come and take the throne over. You had, you had glimpses and I'm not saying I'm a fan of these bands or cause I am mm-hmm. a fan of these bands and some not, but, and I'm not saying these bands weren't or aren't big, but you had bands that you, I thought along the way, even though they're not the same kind of music, you know, everything from Venge Sevenfold, yeah. Trivium, Slipknot, Korn, uh, you can go uh, System of Down. You can go to any kind of guitar-based, heavy rock, heavy metal music. And you can go through the list and you can go, okay, they're big. They're playing, you know, big places and blah, blah, blah. But nobody's even come close to Metallica. No. So I don't know what this is, but there seems to be a, a stall for the last few decades on on this. And it can't end. I mean, it, this isn't the end. There has to be. I just might be 60, 70 years old before the next Yep. real big things come Revolution. along in music yeah it's almost like people are saying here's the stage come and take someone please someone come and take it come and take the stage where it's yours but when no one's jumping up there it's like you know someone t- coming to grab thor's hammer right i don't want to go down the comic book route but i mean okay here's the hammer come and take it somebody and no one can no one's gonna you know uh, uh, jumping to get it well yeah. what like what does it take does it take for uh and this sounds morbid but just bear with me and see mm-hmm. if you know what i'm trying to say mm-hmm. So nobody take this out of context. Take the first sentence I just said. If ACDC, Kiss, Van Halen, Slayer, Metallica, Iron Maiden were all to die in one big ass plane crash in a 747, they were going to a festival. Is that what it's going to take for people to say, hey, we got to step up now and replace one of these bands? Because it's like, okay, these bands are getting older and they're retiring and they're almost at the end of their, some of them are almost at the end. But who's sitting in line waiting? It's I not know. Machine Head. It's not Trivium. It's not Slipknot. Corn. Uh, they've they've had their heyday. They never got up there. I mean, it's not about getting up to Metallica. I'm just saying if you compare you it to Metallica, yeah, w- nobody got up there. So nobody's done the Eddie Van Halen on guitar yet. I don't care if people say, oh, what about Joe Satriani? And oh, what about if Randy Rhodes had lived? Or what about you? Know, I'm like, hey man, there is nobody that's ever done what Eddie did to guitar, to music, and to rock party songwriting i mean it's nothing so i don't get it i i'm sitting here waiting and i've been waiting for a decade and a half and watching these bands bet my money on that band's gonna do it mm-hmm. never happened yeah it's like Just no one's in happened. a bullpen there's no one in a bullpen and, and as much as you you kind of gave the um the analogy of uh you know if they were all gone at one time life is picking them off pretty quick as you know as we go by every day we're hearing somebody new in the news that's passed away you know losing malcolm from acdc and just all these like acdc was one of the bands that you mentioned you know we're losing these people left and right i mean we should be getting off our butts and uh, you know pushing you know as, as, as much as we can to for the next big thing uh, so i'm, I'm just uh, I, a, think, I, I think back in the 70s and 80s it was a little different you know record companies were signing bands for long-term thinking they weren't mm-hmm. just doing the one-offs yeah they wanted to build and develop a band that was a normal phrase develop the band was mm-hmm. a 70s thing so i think what happened is when you said there's no one in the bullpen we did have the slipknots the corns that the, all these bands that became huge but the difference is the maidens the now the metallica is coming up the maidens the priests, the Aussie Sabbath, you know, the, all those bands we're talking ACDC kiss. We're talking 30, 40 year old bands here that have been around for 30, 40, sometimes more years. Mm-hmm. The next generation, like the guys I was talking about, the next lineup that had the chance to, to take over that metallic, I'd say the Metallica or the Van Halen or the ACDC throne, their lifespan was in half. They became rich and famous real quick. Did that many records compared to the big guys and now they're on the downside of their career. Uh, they've been sort of out of the game, so to speak, other than festivals and some big tours and, mm-hmm. and stuff. But they they kind of went in half the time of those other bands, went, had their shot, bang, they're on the way, been kind of down. So it's like, well, that didn't work. So where's, like you said, where's the next batch coming from? That's right. And the fact, too, like like you say, 
the, uh, Ingve Malmsteen said this in an interview, and I, I I can't quote him because I don't remember where the interview came from. But of all people, um, you know, sometimes who gets quoted, uh, you know, bad in the press. But he had said, "We're not going to have like the ACDCs anymore and things like that for the sole fact that number one, the record labels are uh, in a handful now. There's a small handful of them. Number two, like you said, development. They'd want to bring you in, like just like when a, a, a young guy w- goes to work for a factory here in Canada or in the United States. They want you in there when you're 16, 18 years old, so you'll be there till you're 50, 60 years old and give you your life." That's what the record labels wanted to do back in the day. Now, sometimes that was to take advantage of you and make some serious money, but they would get you, they would develop you, they put out, you know, 10, 15, 20 records. Um, Whereas today you're lucky to get some uh, financial backing for a single, let alone a record. So that's, so there's, there's two sides to that fence. We want people to be the next superheroes, but how can they do that without labels being behind them without some money? You can only go fund yourself or, you know, crowdfund yourself for so long, you know, uh, to do a small tour or something. So I can see both sides of the coin. It's, it's kind of a bummer. You have to, you really have to, uh, you know, the labels that are putting like five finger death punch or, or some of these bands that are getting money put into them and doing well, Mm -hmm. um, you have to have more of a package, a sellable package for those labels to put the money in now. So it has to be almost a sure bet, which means your image has to be there. We have to make sure your show is right. You, you've got to have the best agents and managers. We need a good producer in here to, to get you guys doing what you should do. You might have to put on a sort of image thing. This is the way I am and this is what we stand for. And you might have to invent that a little bit. So I think the sure bet stuff is is uh, rare, but when it happens, it's... Uh, a lot of times you're getting sort of more of a manufactured thing than a real thing. Whereas Van Halen wasn't manufactured. They were a bar band that became a stadium band. That's right. That's right. Thanks. Thanks in part to Ted Templeman, of course. Yeah. Too. Magic, Mr. <laughs> magic. Quick question. Uh, we talked about the big four and you were just mentioning that as well too. Metallica was obviously, um, is still as, is, is a huge part of that. Um, so Dave Ellison mentioned, uh, on, you know, in passing and said how important that annihilator was to them. Uh, so what is it like, number one, getting a compliment from someone like that? And then where does uh, Megadeth fit in your wheelhouse as far as um, growing up and as an influence? Well, um, I don't know. I it, I met Megadeth guys years ago. The first time I, I talked to them was 89. Dave Mustaine called me. We were on a tour with Testament, our first tour in the States. And Chuck Billy, singer from Testament, came into my hotel room and said, Mustaine's on the phone. And I thought he was joking. Uh, but it was at the time when he was looking for a guitar player for what would end up being Rust in Peace. Their cla- of course, their classic album with uh, the most amazing, you know, lineup, Men's Elves and Mustaine and the amazing Marty Friedman. Uh, and that, of course, became a, to most guitar players and most musicians and metalheads, one of the top five most important records in their lives, careers or in, in metal. Um, so, boy, was I shocked to find out that they would literally drive to the, re- the writing and recording sessions uh, to the Rust and Peace sessions, drive to the studio and rehearsal studio, listening to uh, my records. That is Allison, so cool. Allison Hill. Yeah. So I was like, and I, I sometimes I, I use that kind of playfully to explain to some people that just because you're in a bigger or more famous band or like you're an older band, like let's say Ramstein, mm-hmm. don't, don't think for a second. Actually, I think I'm older than them, but uh, they're bigger. <laughs> For, don't don't think for a second that the older bands are the more established or the bigger ones. Don't listen to newer bands. Of course. Because I listen to Megadeth, Slayer, Metallica, Exodus, Razor, Voivod, Anthrax, uh, Creator, Destruction, Loudness, ACDC, Kiss, Scorpions, everything. The Sweet. I just have a whole list of hundreds of, of musicians and bands I listen to. Um, and when you get out there and you tour and you put records out, it's amazing. The ones you meet that are legendary who actually go, Hey, I got your record. And you're like looking at them going, you have my, like Glenn Tipton, Judas priest is my favorite heavy metal guitar player. Okay. Yeah. Guitar player be Eddie, but yeah, for metal metal Tipton has the rhythm lead and songwriting down. He's good. More than anyone. I think. Sure. And we got on the tour with them in 91 with Judas priest on their big tour, painkiller simply because he liked the record. And I'm like, what? You know, and here's a good one for uh, for Tipton. Up until the Painkiller album, Glenn Tipton was playing his blues bass lead guitar solos. Okay. Then all of a sudden, what happened? A guy named Scott Travis comes in who was in Racer X, okay. who was Paul Gilbert, 
and comes in, and Glenn Tipton is now a blues-based Glenn Tipton meets Paul Gilbert. Okay. So it's a connection there. And to do what Glenn Tipton did on the Priest album, Painkiller, mm-hmm. he was going back to a kid that was younger than him, and he was – Tipton must have sat in his room or studio or whatever <laughs> and practiced his balls off for a year or two to be able to to – to get influenced by Paul Gilbert. Maybe he had lessons from him. I have no idea. He might have. And he comes out with Painkiller, shocks every lead guitar player out there that liked them, and went, what? This is Glenn Tipton meets Paul Gilbert now. Yeah. So, and you're thinking, this is already at the time the legendary Glenn Tipton, and he's going back and listening to another younger guitar player and letting it take over his entire lead guitar playing style. It, it's mind-blowing. So when I find out Rammstein guys know my stuff or, or Megadeth, even though they had been around a couple of years earlier than us, uh, quite a few years earlier, mm-hmm. we're listening to my stuff. It's like, and then it was like, you see the smile coming on my face, oh, right? Of course. It's like, holy crap. Cause you're, you're, I'm a metal fan. So that was just mind blowing. And then as you go along, you realize, you know, it's great. Take these as like most amazing things and you should be happy to happen, but just don't let it get to your head because right. we're, we all do the same thing. I listen right now. I got a, I don't think this is a younger band, but Byzantine. Okay. And there's a band called Goat Whore, which the name threw me off for years. I never wanted to listen to a band called Goat Whore, not because I'm a jerk, but mm-hmm. just sounded too satanic or death metal. Yep. Not my liking. I just started listening to them last month, realizing how amazing they were in this band, Byzantine. And and there's younger bands that I listen to that I'm just blown away by. And that those influences are going to hit up on my next Annihilator record. There's no way of getting around it. Yeah. It's just good music. So I think that's the cool thing I'm learning is that I have had a bit of an influence on some of my favorite musicians. Meanwhile, they've had 99% of the influence on me. But yeah. still, it's to be in that little group or big group of uh, people that are in that circle of wanting to learn new stuff and get influenced by what they like, it's like, Hell yeah. So it, it's, it's really all cool. part of a legacy for sure. I mean, what you've done for, for metal itself is one thing and that's phenomenal to be commended. Uh, but also the fact that you, you know, uh, respected by some of your peers, that is, that's all part of the legacy. And that's something to be very proud of for sure. As a musician, I like, I'm more of an artist than a, or a artist guy mm-hmm. than a, let's sell millions of records and, right. and, you know, plan it. Um, you know, I, I'm very lucky that I've had that option because most bands that just do what they want, like when I do my records, I just deliver the masters to the label. Mm-hmm. They don't tell me who to, to produce it. They don't say, Jeff, the last one was kind of crappy in this way. Can you get somebody to do a better job on telling you not to to be sounding so much like this singer that you like and all that? They don't even tell me that. They just say, just do what you got to do, but don't make sure you light a fire under your butt. Don't get lazy. Right. But I just, I deliver the CD. I do whatever I want. And I'm really lucky that I can do that. A lot of bands have deals where, you know, they're told what producer's going to do, do them. And, uh, they're kind of told where to go and all that. That's been a down, like a, a negative as far as getting bigger, bigger, so to speak, if that was my goal, which mm-hmm. would be nice, but that's not, that wasn't my goal. But by doing it this way, I'm kind of more of an artist mm-hmm. than an actual, you know, I'm trying to get to the top crap. And I'm lucky that I've been able to make enough money and, and have a career where I don't have to starve and I don't have to worry about it. I can just cruise along and make the music I like and then take the flack and shit for it in the press and the fans if I if I get lazy or if I, sure. it's not as good as it should be. But as an artist, I think that is that even almost surpasses the feeling when you get when you write a song and you think it's a good song. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times you write a song and you think it's great and then a year later you go, oh, that was terrible. You know, like... But I think the feeling of other artists that you respected saying stuff, I think it even surpasses that. Yeah, it's, it's got to be a very, very cool feeling. And the fact, too, going back to the labels, the fact that you can show up record after record after record, and they're, they're not, I mean, you can call record labels lazy, you can say whatever you want. They're, they're in the business to make money uh, and stay in business to making money. And in fact, yeah. they, if they know they're going to make some money off of what you've just done, and they haven't sent you back home and said, okay, Jeff, not bad, <laughs> but let's see what take two sounds like. The fact that you've been yeah. able to do this again and again, that is, that's awesome uh, as well on the resume. For sure. It's uh it's kind of nice to be able to just you know, like I probably have a different view of it if I lost my record deals, nobody yeah. wanted to sign me and things were going down. I'm sure I'd change my tune a little bit as far as getting bitter and all that. Of but, course, but again, I'm I don't I won't say I'm spoiled. I worked hard at this, but mm-hmm. it, it's 
I'm very lucky. Like yeah. there's work, there's work and all, all these other factors, but there is some luck in it too. Yeah. It's building the foundation. It's taking a lot of years to build the, fo- uh, build the foundation, but at the same time, you just can't sit there and coast on it either. You still have to, uh, almost like you're auditioning for the job again to keep the job. Yeah. yeah. You got it. Yeah. yeah working I- hard, Try, trying to set up now, uh, lots more touring and, and that, but it's, it's actually getting easier with age, not because it's, a route more of a routine to set these things up. I've been doing this for a few decades myself, but mm-hmm. it's more like the popularity of my band's going up slowly every year. So it's like, what? Are you serious? Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's out there. There's a buzz, and people they want it. So, um, one of the questions I had on the uh, itinerary here, which is uh, being asked over in the chat, a good friend of ours here on the show, Carlos Santen. He's a, another Canadian guitar player. He's a lefty player. And it makes it a little more difficult for him, uh, especially in the EVH line. They've only got a few guitars made for um, lefties. But I've also converted him. Th- so it's your fault. But I've converted him to a Helix user as well now, too. He's using the Helix and the HX effects. And he has a good question. He says, uh, Jeff, are you using the Line 6 uh, Helix exclusively for recording in live? And what are you yeah. playing on stage? So that's my next question to echo what Carlo was saying. Um, are you using it? Tell us how you're using it. Are you using it like a four cable method? Are you running direct to the input of your amplifier? So share with us how you Helix. use Helix. You're talking about the Helix, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I'm kind of a unique person on there. Uh, my, my Jeff stories are usually, I always start them off by saying long story short <laughs> and it too. ends up being a long story, yep. but I'll give you a quick example. The, we did two tours with Testament since October in Europe. We covered everything in Europe and pretty extensive two tours. And it was amazing before Christmas and after. And the first time we showed up, Testament and us, we've toured together before and we're, we're all friends and uh, see each other at festivals. So Testament and, and they brought us on our first tour in the States. So there's a bond there. there there's a real good friendship bond, not just we know them. Yeah. Um, and so Eric, guitar player, very underrated guitar player is riffing is just songwriting. Amazing. Uh, Alex Skolnick, the lead guitar player seems to get a lot of the credit, which he deserves as a lead player. But, yep. uh, Eric's a very underrated rhythm guitar player, um, uh, in metal history mm-hmm. anyway. So Eric and Alex Skolnick and their techs, high paid techs, really good technicians. They each have their own guys and spending a lot of money on equipment. They have racks of gear, campers, everything. They've got racks of this is fancy wireless things everywhere. Everything's just, like, wow, you know, disposal. like seriously, like the, the big time stuff that you could, you could have on tour with you in a foreign country. Uh, if you were selling out pretty big places and you had lots of money to blow. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at the rigs going awesome. And they did their sound check and then they were really cool. They said, you guys can just sound check as long as you want, you know, we're out of your way. And, and we're like, Hey, you guys are the big band here. We're the special guests, but we appreciate it. Thanks. So we had them sort of hovering around going, I think one of them said, uh, where's your back line? And I go, what do you mean? Well, you have your side scrims, you know, your, your two things on the side, the cloth covers that have your cover on it, a CD cover or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're looking behind those going, well, where is your stuff? <laughs> your amps. And I, I point up to the front of the stage where the little pedal board is, and it's not the Helix pedal board. Yeah. It's the Helix LT, the light model of it. Okay. And, or light, whatever yep. LT means. LT, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and they're like, yeah, but where's it running to? Like, there's your pedal board. Where's it going? There's no amp or cabinet back there. And, and I go, oh, we're not using one. And they're looking at me like, <laughs> like your annihilator, your waters. Why, why do you not have at least an amp and cab behind yeah, you? Because 10 marshals or something. To, yeah. You're supposed to have it for feedback. Yeah. So I walked up, I walked up and basically we take a mono XLR out of the little, the cheapest, uh, Helix yeah. LT board. Our bass player uses it and our other guitar player, Aaron, uses it. So we have three LTs lining the stage up front with our microphones hovering over top. Mm -hmm. We have a a Shure uh, wireless tuner pedal. Mm -hmm. It's just a little pedal. It's got a tuner in, which we don't even need the tuner because the Helix has a a tuner in it. Right. And that sits just to the left of the three pedal boards. And that's it. There's nothing else. It's a mono XLR that comes out. And we... Pump it through the front, uh, the wedges, front wedges, the monitors, the floor monitors, and the side fills, whether they're flown or whether they're just sitting on the side. And these guys are like looking at me almost laughing like, you're serious, right? I mean, I know you can do this with fractals, Kempers, sure. helixes, but why? I yeah. mean, you could have a cabinet and amp running. What about feedback? What about this and that? And uh, 
oh, I mean, and I go, what do you mean feedback? And he goes, well, well, to get, if you hold a note to yeah, get the feedback. Sustain it. And I watched Alex, Alex's amazing tech, Carlos, tape down X's all over the, the areas of the stage where Alex you stole could stand. could hold the note and the feedback would happen, hopefully, yep. if he angled his body the right way. And I go over to Carlos and I go, oh, you mean like this? And I, it didn't matter where I stood on the stage. I got feedback, perfect feedback, wherever I stood on a note, right? Oh, and boy. Then we played. And they were like shocked because like, what in the hell are you doing waters? And they heard it out front and they went, oh boy. And what happened is I'm telling you that the campers, the fractals, there's a couple of similar ones mm -hmm. out there. You had rushes and I stuff. Was luck I, I was lucky enough to find out from day one that the, um, the helix was the only one that if you tweak it enough, you can, f you can find the one thing that all those other ones don't have. You remember the nineties tuned down EMG gritty digital guitar tones mm -hmm. yep that that's coming from the amg pickups and you know the, the yeah. stuff you can't get rid of yeah and a bit of a digital vibe well that's the thing that that i think these digital amp including line six who were the instigators of this whole digital amp thing with their flex tone flex tone two mm -hmm. betas betas two beta twos yep. in the year 2000 or whatever when they tried it they were great concept but they melted in the sun on the hot stages and they just had this digital horrible digital grit kind of sterile at it. the time nobody really has learned how to nail that tube hetfield or marshall jcm 800 gunk 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 mm -hmm. right yep and line six it's hard to find but you can find it on the helix i couldn't find it on the fractal or the uh the kemper mm -hmm. so that's a big deal because the helix pedal board that we use is probably a third or a quarter a third of the price of a full maybe a quarter of the price of a full pedaled racked power amped kemper oh, for sure for sure. So um, I found that out quickly that I could find it on my last two albums, especially last album. You will hear more of a Marshall kind of uh, sound on there. And if I told you it was a 57 in front of Marshall, I think a lot of good engineers and, and guitar players would be fooled by that. Yep. Uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't realize that I'm full of shit. This is a, a helix. <laughs> yeah, they believe you. They'd believe they believe it, but it's not the thing. It, it, yeah, because it, it sounds freaking good. And so we did that little feedback test, and they're looking at us in sound check. The very next day when it was Testament's uh, second show, I think it was second or third show, all of a sudden we weren't blocked from uh, the venue, mm -hmm. but we weren't, we were, we could tell the vibe was just don't go near the stage today until you're called. Oh, wow. Uh, and they, they did a three hour guitar uh, check. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, and, and what blew my mind was, is how good those players are. Yeah. How good how good the techs are, how good the band is. How amazing it was to look at all these this incredible gear in racks and knowing that they must have spent a massive fortune flying these around. Mm -hmm. Whereas whereas what we do is uh and festivals all over Europe where we're flying all the time and going on major festivals, major touring even, mm -hmm. big places, big freaking places here and clubs yeah. all the way up to the top. So sure. Um, and what we do is the three of us, bass player and us two guitar players, we will take four Helix LTs in total. So there's one each and then one roaming backup that has Spare. the bass and the two guitar players sounds there. If one goes down, which it hasn't, run over that fourth one to whoever needs it. Yep. And so with those four Helix LTs, me, bass player, guitar player, and one of our two guitar techs, plops it in with clothing in our suitcase and our luggage. Uh, there's no extra shipping. There's no overweight baggage because the thing's so light. That's right. There's nothing. And then our other tech will take some cables and the Sure tuners, little three little boxes and a backup one. Mm -hmm. And we're done. We can fly around the world at almost no cost and, and play stadiums and play the biggest festivals in the world with that helix and even with a camper mm -hmm. you got to still have the pedal board you got to have the rack and people want that power amp and that yeah. speaker cap behind them and the other question we got later from the testament guys was well what about this feel how you you don't have that amp and cabinet behind you mm -hmm. well i can tell you one thing if your sound coming out of the helix you go up front to the different PA systems around the world that we play in mm -hmm. and you sit there with, we, our sound man has been a, a guy named Malta and he's a sound man for the band behemoth, Polish band behemoth. Okay. He is, he's a mother effer. He is a killer sound man. He knows he's like one of the best sound men I've ever worked with or heard. Mm -hmm. And he's, he said, when we 
he plugs that helix in everywhere we go in the world with him. He goes, he, he just has to make one or two little EQ cuts, a tiny little bit of limiting for if something's a little too hot that day on the clean, clean tone, like spiking out on the clean. Yeah. And he goes, that is it. He can get our sound in about 15 to 20 seconds. And he's, and literally run up the sound and we're done. It's, it's that quick and easy. And, He's blown away. He's telling everybody about the Line 6 Helix now. I mean, everybody's doing the same. Yeah. But we got all these people, at, at techs and musicians, uh, coming up to us, taking a look at what we're using at the Vakken Festival or at any <laughs> of these big metal fests. And they're kind of laughing. And then when we play, they're like, oh, I get it. Oh, and then my point was, through the babbling, was that one of the questions I had on the Testament tour to me was, don't you miss this like amp and cabinet thing and, and, you know, knowing what it sounds like. And I'm like, you know what, because Malta's out there doing sound, which I don't even need actually just run the fader up with it, whoever you got. And I don't have to worry about the guitar sound. Um, even if the house monitors or, or we got a blown up monitor, or maybe it's not the best EQ'd uh, monitoring system on the stage. Mm -hmm. We, we know in our heads that out front it's sounding killer. So That's right. you can, you can have the crappiest sound on the stage, but if you know that that's not what people are hearing, then you win. And that, that makes it so much easier. You don't have to worry with, you know, worry about in what your, things sound like in your in-ears, which yeah. I don't use any. Yep. You you just play and you know that out there, they're they hear they're hearing a good sound. So. Yeah. I can't wait for you as we were talking off the air to try the power caps because I know this is new to you. They're the brand new speaker they just brought out. It's 112 uh, power, 250 watts. So if you want to have that feel of a monitor up front because you don't wear in-ears, Stick them up. You can run them in stereo if you want to. Have one right in front of you at your mic stand, and you want to bend down and get some feedback off the speaker as well, too. It's absolutely phenomenal. I'll send you some links to it af after the show over the sure. weekend. But um, I'm not going to ask you any more questions. We got about uh, 15 uh, from myself. We got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to try to reserve it all for the fans over in the chat. Uh, so Kenny Carpenter says, Love you guys. Very tight band. Um, let me see here. Um, yeah, let me, what else? We, Guitar Battles is here. Says, Hey, what's up? Big fan of Jeff for sure. Uh, let's continue down the road here. Um, Carlos commenting on the blacked out EVH really loves it. I know I'm way behind in the chat and that always happens. So I'm probably a good 15, 20 minutes Oops. behind. Uh, well, yeah, but that, that's, that's because you got a, a yapping Canadian taking hey, up the airtime. I, I, I get called the yappy Canadian all the time. So you're in good company. We're, we're good. <laughs> I'd, I'd much rather have people. I, I, dead air is not a fan of, I'm not, I'm not a fan of dead air on the show. So I, more people that can talk. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, and good, I'm good, sure good, people good. like it when I don't talk as much too. So. Um, <laughs> Daniel Babin says, Hey, Eric and Jeff, cool looking acts. Um, uh, Blimpa says I died and went to heaven, guitar heaven. Yeah, that's absolutely beautiful. Um, <laughs> good, uh, nocturnal butterfly who is my better half here. Um, by the way, too, she's starting her own, um, uh, a part of three people, a uh, humbucker lover, uh, from guitar news network, single Carl lover and poison Ivy here, or I'm nocturnal butterfly. They're doing a guitar news network starting tomorrow at three o'clock. The oh. link, link is down below guys and girls should so have a look at that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so we're a YouTube family here. The boys doing YouTube, uh, the, the wife's doing YouTube. I'm doing YouTube. It's a, it's a YouTube family. <laughs> <laughs> Single coil says, holy shnikes, does he says, you have enough guitars? We never have enough guitars, but as you alluded to, you know, you got five that'll, that'll do the job for you and the rest are just there to, uh, to make you smile I in think, the morning. I think if, if I wasn't the bass player in Annihilator, it, it would be four. <laughs> there you go. That's right. Uh, let me see what else I missed here. Uh, let's scroll down a little bit more here. Um, yeah, there you go. Forgot about, uh, Billy Gibbons when talking about dime, Billy Gibbons is another tone master and hard to believe that guy gets tone with an eight gauge guitar strings. Oh, Jeez, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, for sure. For sure. Uh, let me see here. What else? Warren Hughes is here. Talk about another guitar monster. Warren Hughes, uh, um, phenomenal players to sup Eric and Jeff. I'm a big fan. Uh, Larry Olson is here saying what's up Eric and everyone else. I'm just gonna see if I see any questions as we scroll down. Um, let me see here. Uh, I'm way behind in the chat. So once again, thank you to single Crow lover for the, uh, the, uh, actually it's, it's more fun. It's, it's actually, no, I won't say more fun, but it is more fun listening to what people are saying. I know. I agree. I agree. And I'd much rather uh, save my questions for another day. Uh, Carlos says I'm a high school teacher. Every single kid has a phone. I assume I'm being filmed every second of the day. I behave accordingly. It keeps me out of trouble. And that's the thing. We all need to remember that because the phones are yeah. everywhere these days. So we do have to be on our best behavior. And I think in the grand scheme of things, maybe it might make us better people, you know? A little yeah. Bit. And you, you, I mean, they can also be used for, uh, 
against false accusations and and, yeah. and factual things that you need to show did or didn't happen yeah. too. But yeah, it's a double edged sword. Yeah, you get pulled over by the police sometime, and you know they're saying you're belligerent and you're resisting and things like that. Meanwhile, you're sitting there seatbelt on, you know, handing your ID, that kind of stuff. So it can come to save you sometimes. Yeah. Um, let me see what else we got here as well, too. Um, Quentin James, this is a good question. And Quentin, uh, we're going to get him converted to a Helix user. We're slowly and surely. Uh, he says, uh, do you have any issues with uh, sights when traveling with any of your guitars? That's a very good question, Sighties, um, with the Rosewood issues. Oh, uh, do you mean uh, border stuff? Yeah, like import because of, because of the Rosewood. and Yeah. The, there was there was one Epiphone guitar I wanted to get and I couldn't get it because I wasn't able to get it. This was recent too, mm-hmm. I think, in February. I can't remember what it was, but no. And again, um, in my case, like I was saying, a lot of a lot of the guitars I I would use, you know, composite stuff or cheaper. Yep, yep. Kind kind of neck. So I haven't had too many problems with that. I I don't know when that came in, but maybe I got most of my rosewood stuff before that came in. Maybe <laughs> yeah. And I I do know like 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 when you're flying with them now, especially, right? So you've got some that are roasted. Obviously you've got a bunch. So you don't find any trouble when you're checking into different places and flying overseas. But I think overseas, the only thing I've ever taken out of Canada would be this mean street guitar that I just recently got brought to the U S on this cruise that we did. Uh, but everything else is Epiphone. I'm, I'm mainly just traveling for since 2010 with Epiphone. Right. Okay. Um, Steve Segura here says, uh, thanks. Great show, gentlemen. And with a $2 super chat. Thank you. And insomniac, Matt, uh, he, um, he, he likes to know this a lot of times too. He likes to ask a lot of our guests the type of strings, uh, strings and yep. gauge. I'm going to, I'm going to guess, I don't know what strings you use, but I'm going to guess a nine gauge, but tell us a gauge and a brand. Yeah. I, I actually don't practice guitar a lot, so mm-hmm. I have weak fingers. And when I do practice, it's for, you know, trying to get the muscles back and, you know, you get my fingers moving. Yep. And I think that's actually helped my, my physical career over the years that I haven't over practiced or you've been one of these guys that does eight hours a day. I'd probably have arthritis everywhere, but, um, because of that, my fingers are kind of weak. So I, th- I think I'm using a super light gauge and it turns out, I guess I'm not, but, okay. um, nine to 46. Okay. So a uh, light top, heavy bottom. That's cool. Yeah. I, I, and I see some people use eights. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's like, wow. Do you have any guitars like with the arsenal that you have there? You must have some that might have some heavier gauge on them. Yeah. Um, some of my albums we've tuned down a little bit mm-hmm. on and on all my records because my, let's say, let's just say my vocals are not my, my best musical attribute, but I like doing them and I'm working hard to improve them every time I do a record, but I have to tune down a half, what do you call it? Half step yeah. from uh, 440 mm-hmm. normal. So sometimes I'll just ask Ernie Ball to, if they can send me like a 48 to 10 for the studio rhythm guitars, you know, um, but then live, I just go back to the nine to 46. But when I, when I've done songs where I really tuned down, which haven't been for a few years, I guess, uh, yeah, I just go down to the 50 to mm-hmm. 11, that kind of thing. But I'm not, I'm not really tuning down much. Ironically though, this band I told you about goat horror, mm-hmm. uh, my mother would love that name. <laughs> that band has really got me thinking about tuning down again. And I, I don't know if that's my strength. I, I've always wanted to play songs as heavy with not so much the groove, but just a heavy power punch of a Pantera and uh, the real aggression, speed, aggressive violence vibe of a lot of Slayer stuff. But I've never been able to do it. I've always wanted to do that with my music and my band, but it's I've got too much of the melodic stuff in me to really get there. And I'm not a super angry guy, so it doesn't help. Um, so I guess I want to tune down on the next record, but I'm going to have to make a decision. Uh, I've got it on my list right over there on the console to decide tomorrow. If you're going to tune if, down. if I decide to tune down a bit now, um, I'm going to call a friend of mine and he'll have to restring all these guitars. Again. Antonate him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Just find, just find a couple, just find a couple of them, you know, that maybe you can get away with, with the tune down. Uh, Cause you're probably not going to tune down for everything. Or, or do you think you might? Well, that's the problem. I, I'd want to do the whole thing in one tuning yeah, or the drop, the lower and dropped, uh, bring it up, you know, like drop, go whole, a uh, whole full step down. And then some songs maybe even go lower in the low string down, right? The drop thing. But, uh, it's, it's all, it's one or the other. I just, I want to stay at least at one, either 440 or half step down or a whole step down. Just stay one of those for the record. Yeah. Perfect. 
Um, over in the chat, Steve Zagara uh, says, thanks, great show, gentlemen, with a $2 super chat. Thank you so very much. Uh, Sloss says, he has a question, says, got any used, ex- uh, any used explorers for soloing? If so, let me know uh, if it works. Uh, I'm not sure if he's asking if he wants to sell you one, um, but he says a thick fretboard kills me. And uh, that's what you're saying as well, too. You like that kind of a skinnier uh, neck and, and fretboard, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know what size of frets I use on guitars. Like the techs that I work with, they know everything. I could ask them if they were here. To This is exactly what Jeff seems to like on mm-hmm. his guitars. I have no idea. But uh, yeah, I, I guess that's a good question, but not for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I one of the, I've got a couple of guitars here too that uh, only probably two out of the whole arsenal that were, came with tens and sometimes you don't even know if it's a different guitar you can't really tell if it's ten just feels yeah. a little bit more tension and with the line six very axe is one of them and uh, Junior's guitar he got an Eastwood Airline and it came with tens as well too and it's like you know what I was going to change them both I thought no play them and it makes you for me it makes me work a little harder and then when I go to my nines I just kill it and I yeah. love it yeah so that's a, a that's a common thing too mm-hmm. is uh, you know. I think, you know, if I was really smart, I would probably put 10 gauge stuff on my guitars mm-hmm. to practice. And then when I play live, go down to the to the nines. I mean, that would probably be a smart move to do. But usually by the time I start rehearsals, my fingers are just barely alive. So playing the tens would would be tough. But uh, yeah, I hear you. I yeah. one time Ian Thorny was on the show and he uh, I couldn't believe this. I mean, the, first of all, the man is is uh, is a killer player and obviously another fellow great Canadian but yep. he says 11, 12s and 13s he uses on his guitar sometimes. Wow. Can you believe no, that? No, that's Yeah. Oh, that's another uh when you say Thornley, the band Thornley, yep. his band. Uh that first thing that pops to mind totally off topic is I think Randy Staub, the, the guy that worked with Bob Rock on the Metallica stuff, mm-hmm. um Bob Rock's engineer. I think I remember hearing a Thornley album years ago and it had the most coolest, amazing sounding bottom end. And then I started listening to Thornley and figured out how talented he is. Um, guitar sounds and soloing his solos are just oh, insane. such feel. Yep. You know, you know what? I, I can I can never describe his soloing, but here's the way I'm going to try to give you an analogy of his soloing. It's like watching a drunk guy come out of the bar at three o'clock in the morning and kind of he bu- 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 goes over, bumps into a car, rolls over, uh, bumps into a hydro pole, falls a couple of times, picks himself up and just stumbles. That's And Ian doesn't do that as far as making mistakes. It's just scattered like a little squirrel running across the street, yeah. comes back over here. It's like, yeah. what? Jeez, dude, it's crazy. Uh, Hugh Caldwell, another five dollar super chat. Thank you so much. You appreciate that. Kenny Carpenter saying Ernie Ball Super Slinkies. That's a good set, a good brand of strings for sure. Yep. Um, and he's Kenny is asking if you've played a seven string before. No, not really. No, never like grabbed it and seriously played one. I, I remember. Uh, oh, geez, I forget. Oh, anyway, yeah, I, I've tried tried them, but they're just not, <laughs> it's just not I'm for old you. School, right? Yeah, not for old you. Old school. Yeah, it's like it's like a, a road map or a road that you're used to driving down. You know, sometimes you're afraid to take some of these back roads because you might get lost. I know if I play a seven string, it's like, okay, I can barely get by in a six. I think I'll just let's leave the seven for yeah, the guys who exactly. can do it. That's that's how I feel is there's so much to learn on six. But, you know, it, for the for – the, I've seen some of the most amazing uh, – Matias Engler. There's so many guys that can do some amazing things on these guitars. I'm just – I'm an old school. I'll just pick up a guitar yep. and do an Angus thing. That's right. Do it. Do what works for you. Um, single quail lover says, don't forget to leave some likes before you leave. And Salah says, I read about you endorsing and using superior drummer. What about addictive drums or other fave VST or, uh, Dawes? It's the same, same thing with guitars and mm-hmm. with, with all this stuff and studio gear and amps and everything. There's not one good program, not one good amp, one good guitar. There's so many good ones out there. You just got to find what works for you. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, once I found superior drummer, drum, uh, you know, that metal foundry, all that stuff, tune tracks. Um, that was just the one for me. But then I've, I've worked with some guys that have the other, uh, another couple of types of drum programs. And I mean, they're all good. They're all amazing. I mean, there's some great guitars out there, companies and great software companies, amps, everything. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and Samiak Matt says he remembers, uh, Steve says, Jeff, do you think you would ever work with Dave Padden again? Um, I mean, I would mm-hmm. personally and musically for sure. I just don't think Dave, like I talk to Dave all the time. We, we text each other goofy stuff back and forth all the time. Um, and I see him when I'm in Vancouver where he lives. I live in the east uh, near Ottawa, but yep. uh, I don't think so. He's He got basically tired of the, you know, some people, you know, can handle the traveling and the, the lifestyle and 
and, and not get sick of it. And if you start getting sick of it, you reality check yourself and you, you make yourself, you know, whatever it is you don't like about it, you fix it. You mm-hmm. go out for walks, you eat better, you do whatever the hell you have to, to enjoy everything. So I think Dave just pretty much finally got sick of getting on a plane all the time and going places. And I totally get it. And, but I think that's the number one reason he just got tired of the whole thing. And I was putting him through, you know, 12 years and he should have been happy because when I met him, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't really a, a singer. He was a guitar player. Yeah. He played, in a, he played in a band temporarily for a uh, theory of a dead man, a Canadian band here. I did not know that. Uh, and then he uh, just for a filled in for a guy that I think that was sick or something happened. So he was on a tour or two with them and did some U S touring and Canadian stuff. But he wasn't actually a singer. He just auditioned for it when he found out we were looking for one. And okay. uh, basically, between him and I, he became a singer. And then he turned into our guitar player singer. Yeah. And and he, he just started kicking butt after about four years. But um, we had a good friendship. Uh, still do. Well, that's good. I, I just don't I don't think he'd want to do it. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's happy with the life he's got in Vancouver. He doesn't have to leave home. He's having a good time there playing in a couple of cover bands. Has fun. Perfect. Well, that's, that's keeping him happy. That's all that matters. This would be our last yeah. question for the evening here. Guitar Battles Live says, uh, who are some of your favorite thrash players, rhythm and lead? Thrash players. Mm-hmm. Thra- okay. I guess it depends on where you're from, what the word thrash Definition. means. I know it sounds like an obvious thing, but mm-hmm. yeah. and plus your age too. I guess like I, I think thrash metal would be Razor to, to uh, Destruction Creator. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I don't know. I'll just say in metal in general. Okay. In the heavier stuff. My favorite guitar players? Mm-hmm. Say, well, old school, you got to go with, I mean, my old school stuff is Hanneman, King, Gary Holt. Sure. Rick Exodus, uh, uh, Rick Hunold, um, you know, Dave Carlo from Canada's Razor, John Ritchie from Exciter. Uh, uh-huh. uh, you know, they're thrash. I don't, I don't know. Destruction creator. <laughs> There's just so many. So many cool bands out there and guitar players in all kinds of metal music. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I'd have to, it, it's almost like you'd have to name me off a bunch of thrash bands and then I go, oh yeah, that that's guy. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole nother episode in itself. It's just, it's just, you know what, when I was, this will give the person who asked the question, I don't know what age mm-hmm. he or she is, but I'm 52. So when, if you can imagine this, when I was a kid or teenager, the um, heavy metal was all over the the magazines, Hit Parade or Cream, all that stuff. They were heavy metal magazines, and they had heavy metal bands in them. And heavy metal was ACDC and Kiss. So if you can imagine today trying to tell somebody that ACDC is heavy metal, they would go, are you kidding me? Like, that's ACDC's hard rock. That's, that's not right. heavy metal. So because I'm a little older, thrash metal – to to me, when I hear some people talk about thrash metal, I talk about my th- favorite thrash metal bands, and they're going, "That's not thrash, or that's not <laughs> what I'm talking about." That's right. Yeah, that's like saying some, to someone, "I like spicy food." That's not spicy. I'll show you spicy. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's exactly. Right. That's fantastic. Listen, um, tomorrow uh, I want everyone to check out uh, the Guitar News Network. It's been posted over in the chat. So those of you who are in the chat are still here. Uh, check out Guitar News Network. Go subscribe there if you can and watch for their show tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's going to be a lot of fun. Poison Ivy is going to be on there or a Nocturnal Butterfly. i got to get used to saying her name that way. Uh, it's going to be yeah. a lot of fun. Um, I'm really happy to have you back, man. Um, i, I got to give you lots of thanks. Number one, to thank you uh, for inspiration. Thank you for the friendship. And thank you for turning me on to uh, Helix as well because – if it hadn't been for for you being on the show, I wouldn't have discovered the product. I've got a second show now called The Helix Hour. Still the same channel. Awesome. Yeah, I've got Frank Rashad, who's um, uh, one of the senior yeah, product. Yeah, I, fo- I follow you. I follow yeah. you. Hey, and it's uh, this works out to my benefit then. You can repay me by teaching me all about the proper way to put my effects into the Helix, on, not just on the input of the Helix. Yeah, with this. I'm going to help See, you I've got, For those of you here... Let's give a darn. I've got a pedal board down here. I don't even know where my hand is in this picture. Yep, we got you. We got you. you. See it? Yep. So I've got all these, you know, Van Halen pedals, Electric Mistress, Kirk Hammett Wah. And I basically just put this in the front of the Helix, but apparently that's not the right way to do it. So you're going to teach me that one. I appreciate it. Yep. There's, <laughs> there's no right and wrong, but as uh, and actually a happy birthday to Mr. Helix himself, Eric Klein from, from Line 6. It's his birthday today. Awesome. But he will tell you that the Helix uh, and most modelers for that matter like a nice, clean, not overdriven signal coming into the Helix. And you can go crazy going out. So I'm going to show you some ways to use them with like a Helix. Clean it up. Yeah. Put it in the loop 
which isn't don't get people don't get scared when I say loop because a lot of FX you would normally not run in a loop, but in Helix it's basically a switching system as well too. I will teach you that no problem. It's the least I can do to help sure. you, and um, maybe awesome. one of these days we can Thanks. do it in person. Thanks for having me again, and hi to everybody that was listening and will be listening. Thank you. Thank yeah, you so th much. Thank you so much. I'm going to say goodbye to you off the air. So everyone, have a fantastic weekend. I hope you have a great one. It's a long weekend here in uh, in Canada. Uh, tune in tomorrow night. Uh, sorry, guys, tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over on Guitar News Network, and then come back and see me again on Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Helix Hour with Frank Rashad. We're looking forward to it. Everyone, have a fantastic weekend. We hope you have a great one, Jeff. I'll say goodbye to you off the air. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you all very wait, soon. Wait, wait, wait. What, what do you got? What do you got? Oh, dude, you got it's my stool. I got me and my one. stool. Me and my stool say thank you and have a great weekend. <laughs> that sounds that sounds awesome. You and your <laughs> hey, you're not going to Tim Hortons, are you? Speaking of stools, no way. Okay, <laughs> you, you, I'm sure you saw that, right? Yeah, the the flinging footage. Oh, I got you. Oh boy, yeah, monkey monkey poo, monkey poo. All right. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my uh, Van Halen sandals and I'll have a good night. I'll talk to you later. Sounds good. See you, everyone. Talk to you next time. Cheers. I am now on Patreon. If you enjoy my content and wish to support my channel and what I do, then please check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash evhgeartv. Your support assures the continued growth of this channel and a fun community in which to share our love for Van Halen, music gear, and much more. My name is Eric. I play Wolfgang Guitar. Video production services provided by Design 39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for EVH and Gear TV are provided by Rode Microphones, and official Van Halen merchandise is provided by vanhalenstore.com.